The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, beginning our study in verse 16. And we will be looking once again at the words of Jesus Christ Himself today. And Lord, we ask that You would sanctify us by Your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, Matthew 16, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 16, and going through the end of this chapter, Jesus says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. As sheep in the midst of wolves. Throw a sheep in the midst of a pack of wolves and watch what happens. It won't be pretty. Well, Jesus says to those of us who belong to Him, you're going to be like a sheep in the midst of wolves in this world. And what he is saying is that many people who have no regard for Christ or the Word of God, especially will hate preachers who preach the Word, and will hate any Christian who says what's right and does what's right. In other words, Christ obviously is saying, He's saying, don't expect the world to pat you on the back for being like me. Because it's not going to happen. He says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In other words, be righteous, but be on your guard. Just because you are holy and you wouldn't hurt anyone, doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who won't hurt you. Or who... It doesn't mean that there, there are, are not any people out there who aren't interested in hurting you. There are. Verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. And Jesus is talking to his apostles here, and that is exactly what happened. Just as Jesus said. All the apostles were beaten because of their faith. All of them were jailed because of their faith. And all but John was put to death because of their faith in Christ. And here's the thing. It was all done legally. It was all done according to the laws of the land. And the lesson for us there is don't be surprised if the laws of the land do not always uphold biblical values. But if they do not, we must, even if it costs us, we must uphold biblical values. Verse 18, Jesus says, And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Wicked men would arrest the apostles because of their devotion to Jesus Christ. But instead of being, being upset over this unfair treatment, the apostles were to recognize that God is sovereign, God is in charge of all things, and if he allows something bad, then he wants to use it as an opportunity for us to witness for him. How are you going to witness to judges, to lawyers, to people in prisons, to people wherever? if you're not persecuted for Christ and therefore put in these situations. So they are to recognize the sovereignty of God and even all these bad things and the fact that God wants to use them. 19. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. In other words, God will give them the words which will honor Christ. And it's, a true, it's true for us too. In a crisis, God will give His people the words that He wants them to speak. God will give His people the words that He wants everyone involved to hear. Now, God does not promise to give us words which will get us out of trouble. He promises to give us what we need to say 
whether people accept it or not, that's a whole different I, that's a whole different issue. Verse twenty one. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Treachery, betrayal, backstabbing await all disciples of Christ who live holy and speak the truth to one degree or another, especially, and it's worse uh, at some, some uh, you know, in some cultures than others and at some time period than others, <clears throat> but uh, the, the point is this, this is true. A holy church will not be popular in an unholy world. Say it again. A holy church will not be popular in an unholy world. And if a church or a Christian tries to be popular with a sinful world that rejects Jesus Christ and the Word of God, well, if you try to be popular with people like that, then you're going to lose your effectiveness for Christ because the only way you're going to be popular with a world that rejects Christ and rejects the Word of God is to water down the message and to compromise holiness. Then you lose your effectiveness for Christ. But time after time, Christians and Christian groups and Christian churches, so-called, try to appeal to the world and try to get down on the world's level. And they become very popular but they lose their effectiveness for Christ. 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Now he says, he says, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. That's not, that's not to say that every single human being on the face of the earth, all 6.5 billion people on earth, will hate holy Christians. It's not saying that every single human being will hate us. But what it is saying is that no matter where you go, it's going to be the same. In general. All cultures, all classes, all nationalities will hate the Christian, will hate the preacher who proclaims the, work, the words of Jesus Christ that he is the only way to heaven. No matter what country that message is preached in, it is unpopular. And there will be trouble for the messenger. That is what Jesus is saying. But we got to do it. He says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. So it's not going to be easy, Jesus said. If you're holy and you speak the truth, it's not going to be easy for you. But if you want to be saved, you have to endure to the end. Can't bail out on me when times get tough. Now, starting with Christ, obviously, is important, but so is finishing. And those who reject Christ when times get tough, well, they're not going to be saved. Got to hang in there, regardless of the cost. 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. It's not a, not a sin to avoid trouble, if you can avoid it biblically. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The return of Christ here, the coming of the Son of Man, refers to, it doesn't refer to his second coming at the end of the age. That's obvious because the gospel certainly has gone throughout Israel. And he isn't back yet, so it can't be talking about that. The return of Christ here refers to his return to judge Israel, which happened in 70 AD. Jesus came. Jesus came in judgment. That's what it's talking about. When the Romans demolished the city of Jerusalem and demolished the temple. And here is what Jesus is saying. He was telling his apostles that they will be so despised by the unbelieving Jews and so persecuted that judgment will hit before some people in Israel have a chance to hear the message of Christ in person. 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. A student isn't greater than their teacher, 
and a messenger isn't greater than the one who sent them either. 25. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, Beelzebub is talking about a, a demon or someone who is evil, how much more will they call those of his household? And this is what Jesus is saying. You belong to me. You live for me. Don't expect to be treated any differently than I was. You live for Jesus. You say the things that he said. You do the things that he did. You are holy like he was. You speak the word of God like he did. In an unwatered down way like he did. And you wonder why you get opposition? In this world? Don't wonder. The mystery is solved right here. If they call, if the world called Jesus evil and they hated Jesus, then who are Christians to think that they should be able to please God and still be loved by the world for it? Christ says it's not going to happen. That's why. I'm sorry, but, you know, I look at these ministries that are just loved by everyone in the world, it seems like. Even, you know, I mean, so many people that don't even claim to be Christians, they just love these people. Um, there's something wrong there. Woe unto you, Jesus said, when all men speak well of you. They're holding something back. They're not saying what Jesus said. They're holding back truth. 26. Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Do not hold back the parts of God's word that will make you unpopular. People may call us narrow-minded for preaching the Word of God. People may say that we are un unloving because God will judge sinners. And that's what we say. And people may say that we are narrow because we say Jesus is the only way. But Jesus said that. And God says the day will come when the people will know the truth. And His people who were falsely accused are going to be vindicated. 27. Whatever I tell you in the dark, Speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. In other words, listen to what Jesus tells you in private as you read the Word of God, as you sit in the Bible study, as you sit at church, listen to what Jesus tells you, and then go out and live it. And go out and talk about it in public. And don't hold back. And, and it can be fearful. But Jesus says in verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, if we fear God, we won't have to fear anyone or anything else. If we fear God, we will be right with him through Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, the worst that anyone or anything else can do to you is kill you. And that just means you go to you just, that just means you go to heaven, which isn't bad, which is pretty good. Verse 28 again. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The only thing that we should fear is hell. Everything else is temporary and minor when compared to the horrible and endless sufferings of a sinner who rejects Christ. Stay out of hell, is what Jesus is saying. At all costs, stay out of hell. Period. 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. Not many people pay attention to a little sparrow, you know. Big deal. A sparrow just flew by. Who cares? Don't even notice it. But God thinks they are a big deal. And when a little sparrow dies, a sparrow that no one ever even knew was living, that no one ever even cared was alive in the first place, when that little sparrow dies, its death is a big deal to God. Because He cares about His creation. And then Jesus says in 30, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. One hair 
on your head doesn't mean much to you. One strand of hair is worthless. What is one strand of hair worth? Not much. Especially if it falls off your head, gets in your food, or gets in your mouth. That's a pain. But one strand of hair is worthless. But God takes the time to notice it. If it is a part of you, then it is important to God. 31. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. God did not send his son in the form of a sparrow to die for sparrows, to take sparrows to heaven. Well, God cares about every little bird. But he became a human being. And he died for us so that we could go to heaven. So, yeah, he, he's concerned about sparrows. But look how much more he's concerned about us. He became one of us. So if God is willing to do that, then he must love us an awful lot. And therefore, we don't have to be afraid of anything. Verse 32. Therefore, whosoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. If we are not ashamed of Christ before those who reject him, then Jesus will tell the Father that we belong to him after we die. You know, at some point and in some way before someone, a Christian should say, I belong to Christ and I'm not ashamed. That's very important to Jesus Christ that we do that. And we move on now to verse number 33. But whosoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And this isn't talking about an occasional failure to speak up for Christ. This is talking about someone who never says, I belong to Jesus. Doesn't want anybody to know. Doesn't want to be connected to Christ. Or it's maybe talking about someone who has confessed Christ at one time, but then later renounced him. If we say, I don't know Jesus, then Jesus is going to say, I don't know you either, on Judgment Day, and that's going to be a hard pill for us to swallow. 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus came to die and to bridge the gap between sinners and God, that's for sure. But he did not come to try to get everyone to get along with each other. I mean, that would be nice if everybody loved each other and everybody got along, but that's not the reason Jesus came. Actually, the natural result of some receiving Christ and some rejecting Christ is strife. The unsaved who do not feel comfortable with Christians who live and speak the truth that's never going to, I mean, I should say the unsaved who, who reject the word of God, they do not feel comfortable with Christians who live and speak the truth. They never have, they never will. And so Christ said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. The, the connection between a Christian and Christ is stronger than the connection between that Christian and a member of their family. A Christian who wants to stay connected to Jesus is going to refuse to go along with sin in order to please a family member. And that often leads to strife, because the unsaved family member doesn't get it. Takes it personally, perhaps. 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who won't live for Christ because someone else doesn't like it has made their choice, and it is a wrong one. And unless they repent of that wrong choice of putting someone or something before Jesus Christ, they're going to be lost. 
and you know Jesus says here he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me no one is no one is worthy of Jesus but those who persevere with Christ to the end will be saved not those who bail out because it causes strife 38 and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me taking up your cross and following Jesus means being loyal to him and not renouncing him no matter what no matter what suffering no matter if it means loss of job loss of friends loss of life that's what it means to pick up your cross and follow Jesus it means being loyal to Jesus even when it costs you no matter what and anyone who renounces Christ because of threats because of pressure because of persecution is not saved period say so they can they be saved well sure if they repent of that 39 he who finds his life will lose it he who loses his life for my sake will find it those who refuse to sacrifice and suffer for Jesus will lose their immortal soul those who renounce Jesus in order to be popular will lose their soul those who are true to Christ even if it means sacrifice and suffering will be saved 40 he who receives you receives me he who receives me receives him who sent me anytime we do something for a Christian we are doing it for Jesus anytime we are rude to a Christian we are rude to Jesus we are all connected and that is how Christ sees it so it's very important for us to be kind to Christians 41 he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward we are in this thing together as Christians we all have certain gifts and opportunities to help the church and to do the work of Jesus we all have our part to play and as we do our part and as we help and encourage one another we will stand before Jesus and share in each other's rewards because we're all connected and none of us can do anything by ourselves 42 and whoever gives and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in my name or in the name of a disciple assuredly I say to you he shall by no means lose his reward his reward as granny would say it you are this is what Christ is saying and he wants us to understand this if you're a Christian you are a child of God in Christ and God has his eye on you and God loves you so much that he keeps track of every little thing anyone does for you and if someone does something nice for you you can bet he's gonna write it down and he's gonna repay them you're that important to him that he is very impressed and very grateful when somebody is good to you because you're his child next time chapter 11 until then so long everyone